Hi, I'm Paul Dietrich of Fairfax Global Markets, and despite the recent upswing in the stock market, I don't think I need to tell you we are living in difficult economic times. Since the near collapse of the global financial system in 2008, the global economy is still as fragile and as unpredictable as it has ever been since World War II. You know, as I travel around the country, I'm struck by how many investors are confused and simply don't understand what's going on in the U.S. economy, and they're worried sick about how to invest their retirement savings in a way that can protect them from all the crazy things that are happening around the world that seem to negatively affect the stock market here in the United States. Uh, over the 13-year period from 2000 to now, the stock market has just recently broken even from the 2000 high, this after 13 years. Investors have made absolutely nothing, and they have just broken even, and it's, it's very hard to retire if your investments are not working and earning any money over a 13-year period. As I travel around the country, I think investors are also sensing something else. Something important is slipping away here in, in America. I, th I think what depressed Americans most over the past five years, even more than the stock market collapse, was the, the spectacle of just unfettered greed and corruption at the highest levels of American business and government. What bothers Americans most is that there seems to be a feeling that our institutions and our government are not and can no longer be trusted. We are living in the age of the empty suit. Those people who were supposed to be watching things, making everything run, keeping it up and operating, they just somehow weren't there. There is this immense sense of absence. I live near Washington, D.C., and I constantly hear some of my friends who have had senior positions in the White House and the State Department lament the short-term thinking that permeates Washington policymaking. One of them asked me recently, where are the really thoughtful people in government and, and business? Where are the wise men? Who are the people with the really long view who are going forth each day with us? deep sense of time and a sense of responsibility for the future. I, I think he sensed the absence too. You know, some of you know that I studied philosophy in college, and one of the reasons I love Asian philosophy so much is that it always takes the long view of life. Uh, two years ago, I, I met with a Chinese government official in Beijing who told me his entire job was to look at every single law and regulation that came up from his department and then try to determine how each law and policy would affect people two generations from now, their children and, and their grandchildren. And I, I kind of went back to my hotel room that night and I became very depressed and that I, I knew that there was not one single person in the entire U.S. government who had a job like that. But, you know, it hasn't always been like that in the United States. I, I believe it was the Native American Chief Seattle who said that uh, the elder, when the elders of his tribe tried to pass laws after they would take into consideration how that law would affect the lives of their people seven generations into the future. You know, one, one wonders how government laws and tax policies would look now if we fully thought through how it would affect the next seven generations in the future. What, what would our foreign policy look like? What would our, our energy policy look like? And, and how our cars are built? How, how would that look? And, and how about our tax and spending policies? You know, in 2009, we spent $3 trillion on stimulus packages, bailouts, and budget deficits. Since then, we have had budget deficits each year of over $1.5 trillion, and we will continue to see that level of deficit spending for the foreseeable future. We currently have over $16 trillion in U.S. government debt that is slated to, to grow to over $20 trillion in another four years. <sighs> Thank God we'll all be dead before someone has to pay that debt back. 
But that is the legacy we are leaving to our children and our grandchildren. They are the ones who will be paying for our entitlements and our fiscal profligacy. I sometimes wonder what they're going to think of us in the future, not with fondness and kindness, I suspect. But what I really want to talk about today are the opportunities for investors. When, when you kind of fully understand, understand what's going on, we are standing at the beginning of a brand new global economic expansion that will be on a scale and size that the world has never seen before in all of human history. That's the opportunity. There are two key long-term megatrends driving this global economic expansion. And first and foremost is the United States. Because of the new discoveries in fracking shale oil and gas, the U.S. will be the only major developed country in the world that is energy independent and exporting energy by 2017 in five years. Because of cheaper energy, manufacturing is starting to move back to the United States from China and Europe for the first time in 15 years. Agriculture and agricultural exports are booming, especially to Asia, and that is transforming the Midwest and rural areas of the United States. Housing is coming back strong, and the U.S. is still the leader in technology and will continue to be for the foreseeable future. Just, you know, sometimes I try to step back and, and just think about how much has changed in our lifetimes because of technology. I mean, no one had a personal computer before August of 1981 when IBM sold the first personal computer. No one except the U.S. government and researchers had access to the Internet before 1992, and now we can't live without it. Uh, there, was, there was no Google before 1999. Today, there are billions of searches performed on Google every day. What I, I want to know is to whom were all those questions asked and answered before there was a Google? Does anyone know? I, I, I sometimes try to stump Google. I asked Google recently how many insurance salesmen there were in North Korea. <laughs> Google didn't know. But did you know that the number of text messages sent and received every day by your kids exceeds the population of the planet? Today, China has over 600 million internet subscribers. The U.S. only has 210 million. Today, China has 750 million cell phone subscribers. The U.S. only has 275 million. China has more than two times more cell phones in use than we even have people in the United States. And China Wireless is now the largest cell phone company in the world, beating out Vodafone and Verizon. According to Forbes magazine, one out of every five couples married in the United States last year met online or through an online dating service. Oh, boy, have things changed. Uh, and according to the former Secretary of Labor, Richard Riley, the top 10 in-demand jobs in the United States today didn't exist 10 years ago. Now think about that. It, if, if that's true, we're currently preparing students in our colleges and university for jobs that don't exist yet. They are going to need technologies that haven't been invented yet in order to solve problems. We, we don't even know what those problems are yet. I mean, that's kind of scary. Uh, last month I read uh, that right now the U.S. is the largest English-speaking country in the world. But by next year, in 2014, there will be more people who can speak fluent English in China than we have here in the entire United States. That means next year, China will become the largest English-speaking nation in the world. You know, there, there can be no doubt that the world is changing so fast, hardly anyone can keep up. Uh, it, it's, it's now estimated that one week's worth of the New York Times contains more information than a person was likely to come across in his entire lifetime in 1776. Now, the second megatrend I want to talk about uh, is Asia. 
and, and there are now 3 billion people living in China, India, and the rest of Asia. According to the World Bank, there are currently 552 million Asians that are middle class as measured by our U.S. standards. In seven years in 2020, that will grow three and a half times to 1.75 billion middle class people in Asia. Now think about the investment opportunities of over three billion newly affluent consumers. Uh, recently, the Chinese government announced they plan to move 250 million people from rural areas into newly constructive cities over the next 12 years. I, I mean, this is like building new cities for almost the entire population of the United States over the next 12 years. The good news is the U.S. stock market and the U.S. economy will be major beneficiaries of this Asian economic explosion. I mean, if you look at almost every industry where foreign investment is allowed in China, American companies largely dominate each field. This new global economic expansion will create more jobs and more wealth than any economist has been able to project. And the U.S. stock market is going to be the major beneficiary of this enormous Asian and global economic expansion. For the past 15 years or so, most of the wealth created in America has come from banking and financial engineering. Remember all the tech IPOs in the, the late 1990s? Remember the subprime mortgage bonds that nearly bankrupted the global economy a few years ago? This isn't the healthiest way to create national wealth. But what we are seeing now in this still emerging recovery is a new American economy that is being built on these five great pillars, energy, the reshoring of manufacturing here in America, agricultural exports, the housing recovery, and technology. I mean, these are real things and they are creating the foundations for real wealth and a wealth that is more broad based than just Wall Street. Uh, I believe we are seeing the beginnings of a new long-term secular bull market that will rival the 1980s and 1990s, which was one of the greatest bull markets of all times. But because this new bull market's foundations are much more solid, much more diversified, and broader based, and then couple that with the growth in Asia. And I believe this coming long-term bull market will be the greatest bull market in history. The fundamentals are all coming together. For investors, especially those of us who are baby boomers, this may be their last and best chance to invest in a long-term bull market to make sure their wealth lasts longer than they do. It also gives them a chance to provide something for their children. So what is the best investment strategy an investor can use to take advantage of this new economic reality and new economic era we are moving into? As an investment manager, my first piece of advice is be careful. Nothing is ever just black and white. And, and despite Despite the enormous future opportunities I have talked about, the global economy has become so interconnected that what happens anywhere in the world immediately affects the U.S. stock markets. We have to remember, once again, that no matter how hard we prepare for political or natural disasters, our control over these events is largely ephemeral. I mean, let's just admit it. We really don't have any control at all. The truth is we live in a much more fragile world than even 10 or 20 years ago. There are now so many things happening in the world that seem to negatively impact the stock market almost every week. And we are more susceptible to these shocks, even though we seem to have no control over any of this. An economist and philosopher by the name of Nassim Taleb wrote a book about what he called black swan events. These are events that are large scale, highly improbable, and irregular, unpredictable events that can have massive economic consequences. 
and these black swan events, which used to be very rare, now seem to be occurring every few months. Uh, as, as the global economy becomes more complex and out of control, it becomes more important than ever for investors to have reserves and backup systems to ensure against breakdowns and unforeseen disasters in their investment portfolios. You know, just like a computer or any complex piece of machinery, the more moving parts you have, there is a higher likelihood of something failing on a regular basis. Uh, this is why we regularly back up copies of our computer files, have extra batteries, and keep spare power cords and software stored in some safe place. We also need to think about a backup system for our personal investments uh, in, in order to protect against all these potential unforeseen disasters. It is sort of like flood insurance. You need to buy it before the hurricane strikes or it just doesn't protect you. And, and we're now living and investing in a very complex global environment that is often out of our control. Having a fail-safe backup strategy for your investments is now more important than ever. The big question most investors are asking themselves is, given this fragility in the world, this fragility in the global stock markets, how do you protect what's still left of your retirement investments? How can, how can you risk manage your investments so that they can withstand these difficult to predict black swan events? Almost all investment managers know what investors need to do to make money over the long term, say 30 or 40 years. We know that in the long run, holding a portfolio of high quality stocks works better than almost any other investment strategy. I mean, economists have won Nobel Prizes for these theories. But the dirty little secret is that while these theories may work if you hold these stocks for 30 or 40 years, but these theories often don't work in the short term. And that short term can sometimes last for over 10 or 15 years. And this drives many investors nuts, and they rightly get upset and confused. You know, in medical science, everyone knows that all it takes to lose weight is to burn off more calories every day than you take in in food. It's very simple, and the science is irrefutable. But the problem is, Americans just can't do it. One third of America is obese and the problem is growing. But the difference between the medical and pharmaceutical industries as opposed to the financial services industries is that the pharmaceutical industry accepts that people will not do the right thing and so they have come up with alternative solutions. I mean, surgeons perform gastric bypass surgery for people to lose weight. Uh, there's an army of pharmaceutical researchers working on pills for people to lose weight. These industries are making an enormous amount of money out of things you have to buy rather than simply dieting and exercise, which is essentially free. But in the financial services industry, there's a relatively new field of academic study called behavioral finance. And we know from the new research in this field that investors simply can't take losses in their retirement investments like they saw in 2000 to 2002 and 2008 to 2009. They, they simply pull their money out of the market at the bottom and they don't get back in until they've missed most of the gains. In the 2000 to 2002 bear market, the S&P 500 index dropped peak to trough 48%. And in the 2007-2009 bear market, it dropped 57%. For the 13-year period from 2000 to mid-2013, the stock market basically just broke even. Uh, for investors, it has been more than a lost decade. After two booms and two busts, the stock market has earned them nothing, or after inflation, less than nothing. And it is very hard to retire if your investments are not working and earning any money over a 13-year period. Most investors know it is a mistake to pull their money out of the stock market after a major loss, but they just can't help themselves. 
So why hasn't the financial services industry, like the pharmaceutical industry, created an investment strategy that can deal with this behavioral problem and help clients through this psychological process? Well, there is now a solution to this problem, and it is called the Two Portfolio Investment Strategy. At Fairfax Global Markets, this is how we do it. We now ask every investor just two questions. The first question is, what percentage of your investment capital can you just not afford to sustain any significant loss in your investments? And the second question we ask is, what percentage of your investment capital are you willing to take some larger calculated risk in order to achieve some growth and accept a higher amount of volatility? The first answer I usually get is, I, I, can't, I can't afford to lose any of my money. Then after the investor thinks about it for a while, they say, well, maybe I could afford to have 15 or 20% in a stock portfolio uh, that takes a little more risk. The first portfolio we use is the Fairfax Global Permanent Portfolio Strategy. Again, for purely psychological reasons, we always create two portfolios for all of our clients and investors. The first portfolio is created just for the money that an investor simply can't afford to sustain any significant losses. Uh, the famous free market economist Harry Brown invented the permanent portfolio strategy in the late 1970s. We basically place 25% of the portfolio in stocks, 25% in short-term treasury bonds, 25% in long-term treasury bonds, and 25% in gold and precious metals. This conservative investment strategy is designed to protect an investor's capital under any set of economic conditions. These non-correlated investment allocations are designed to work during both bull and bear markets and in periods of inflation, deflation, and in periods of recession and depression. You know, in, in, in Greek mythology, the hydra is a serpent-like creature with numerous heads, and each time an opponent cuts off one of the heads, two new ones grow back. Harm is what it likes. The more harm it encounters, the stronger it becomes. And, and there are so many things outside of our control that can negatively impact the stock markets. Uh, I mean, there are politicians, Mother Nature, Middle East conflicts, crazy countries like Syria and North Korea that can all negatively affect global stock markets. Investors today need an investment strategy that is not only robust, but is one like the Hydra. You can't kill it. When you cut off its head, two heads grow back. It comes back even stronger. The permanent portfolio is a Hydra-like strategy. Each of the 25% allocations is designed to thrive in a different stock market environment. It is this Hydra strategy that is designed to lower volatility and provide some aspect of growth in all stock market environments. On top of all of this, at Fairfax Global Markets, we add an additional layer of risk management. When one of these four asset classes declines below its 200-day long-term moving average, that allocation in that uh, uh, that 25% is moved to cash as a component of the Fairfax Global Markets active risk management strategy. During the 41 years of this back-tested performance, the permanent portfolio using the 200-day moving average has had a compounded annual average return of 9.38% which is just slightly lower performance than if an investor had stayed fully invested during all that time in the S&P 500 index, which returned a slightly higher 9.93%. 
But the advantages of being invested in the permanent portfolio using the 200-day moving average over just being invested in the S&P 500 index is you would have had a much lower beta, much lower risk, and the permanent portfolio using the 200-day moving average has only had one negative down year in 1990 when the strategy was down 2.6 percent. But the maximum drawdown during any period for the permanent portfolio using the 200-day moving average was 8.13 percent versus 50.95 percent drawdown for the S&P 500 index. Again, this is the kind of portfolio that lets investors sleep well at night. And they haven't experienced the sharp bear market declines that drive most people crazy and often drive them right out of the stock market itself. Just as a matter of disclosure, I, I would like to make clear that the chart and performance above uh, is an independent back test from uh, December 31st, 1972 to, to June 30th, 2013 of the permanent portfolio strategy and it does not represent the actual returns of the Fairfax Global Permanent Portfolio Strategy. Our, our track record does not go back to 1972. So please contact us at Fairfax Global Markets for information on our specific portfolios. Now the, the second part of this two portfolio strategy is the Fairfax Global Value Stock Strategy. The second portfolio we create for each client and investor is our Fairfax Global Value Stock Strategy. This is a tactically managed portfolio that is invested in undervalued value stocks, but it takes more risk and will have more volatility because it's, it's in the stock market. Uh, this two portfolio strategy isn't really revolutionary. There isn't anything really new here. It is just a better way to manage an investor's expectations and help them over the psychological hurdles that almost every investor experiences in difficult markets. The benefit of this two portfolio strategy is that investors can review their portfolios every month and they see that the Fairfax Global Permanent Portfolio is hopefully growing a little bit every month and, and doesn't have any wild swings in value or volatility. They can also see their calculated risk portfolio, the Fairfax Global Value Stock Portfolio, and the investor understands this portfolio will have a little bit more volatility associated with the stock market, but it will also have more potential for higher growth and larger gains. Look, here's the bottom line. If you are not a day trader and you don't want to gamble your retirement away and you are sick and tired of politicians wrecking our economy and Middle Eastern wars and upheavals and natural disasters like tsunamis and bear markets driving the stock markets up and down and up and down, then you need an investment strategy like I've outlined today. Always remember Warren Buffett's investment rule number one, don't lose money. His rule number two was don't forget rule number one. This two portfolio investment strategy was specifically designed for rule number one. If you invest in the permanent portfolio strategy, you should not sustain any significant losses to your investment capital ever again. You know, there's no perfect investment strategy. If there were, everyone would use it. But it seems to me that if an investor can see every month that his core investments are safe and sound and that the rest is positioned for long-term growth, I believe that is the one sure way to create an investment and economic foundation that can provide wealth and a high quality of life for you as an investor and hopefully for the next seven generations of your family. I'm Paul Dietrich of Fairfax Global Markets and I thank you for watching this seminar.